reasons why our emissions are growing so quickly, in particular, why they're growing so quickly in, in, in contrast to some of the other wealthy countries in the world. And I've got three kind of main points. Uh, first is that we've had really rapid population growth in Canada for a wealthy country. Um, we've seen population growth over the last couple of decades uh, averaging about 1.1 or 1.2% a year. Um, and that is in, uh, similar to the US, about 1.1% a year. Uh, in, in really marked contrast to the, to the other rich countries in the world, you're seeing population growth rates around 0.2, you 0.3% know, a year. Italy is even less than 0.2% a year. And I actually think recently it's turned into a decline population. Um, and so one of the big contributors to this, uh, to this trend in greenhouse gas emissions we're seeing is just population growth. And mo most of that, about two thirds of our population growth is immigration. Um, secondly, we've seen much more rapid economic growth in Canada than some of the other, this is the G7 countries they've got here, uh, than some of the other wealthy countries in the, in the last couple of decades. So even, in, even though you know, we're growing as a population, kind of we're each getting wealthier faster than most of the other countries, which is, which is also contributing to this rising emissions that we've seen over the past couple of decades. And then the big, uh, the big other trend that I'm seeing in the economy, is, and I'm sure you are too, is this structural trend, this, this move towards a much greater share of the energy sector in our economy, particularly for energy exports. And so this is a uh, production uh, figure in the oil sands over the last uh, two and a half, three decades. Um, and it's shown that uh, we're now, uh, the most recent data one I have there, showing that we have about, we're producing about a million barrels a day in the oil sands. For reference, the world oil demands around 85 million barrels a day. Um, and it's also showing that uh, we're projected in the oil sands to keep, uh, to keep growing really, really rapidly. Projections that I've seen have shown uh, around a fourfold projected increase in the oil sands, up to about four million barrels a day over the next decade or decade and a half. And the really interesting thing, from a policy perspective and from a negotiating perspective in Copenhagen, uh, is that all these trends are likely to continue. We're, we're looking at much more you know, continued rapid economic growth, no forecast change in our economic or our immigration policy. It looks like we're going to see rapid, much more rapid economic growth than, than other wealthy countries in uh, the foreseeable future. And like I say, this, this uh, the, the growth in our oil sands is, is just beginning. You know, we're expecting to see actually accelerated growth in our oil sands over the next decade and a half of current policies. And so when you put all these trends together, uh, you get uh, a picture for Canada's emissions over the next couple of decades that looks much the same as it has over the past couple of decades. Uh, we're seeing, we're going to expect to see, without, without a policy implemented, are we really continued rapid growth in emissions? And this is a forecast from four different models that we used to, to try to estimate and they look like, you know, if, if things continue as are, as they are, we would look like maybe a doubling in emissions from 1990 levels, uh, say over the next three decades. So a really, really rapid continued growth in emissions. And like I say, this, this growth in emissions that we're seeing, which is more than, than in other developed countries, really informs both our negotiating position and it, and it informs kind of what we're doing about the problem and how we think about policies. So I've got the same figure that Kathy had up here, uh, <coughs> E-visiting Canada's Kyoto commitment. There's an R, it's supposed to be getting next. This is revisiting Canada's Kyoto commitment. Uh, and so, as Kathy mentioned, uh, what, we, what we promised to back in 1997 was a cut of 6% below 1990 levels by the year 2010 or so. Um, and that doesn't sound like a lot. 6% you know, cut in emissions should be able to do that. But this has to be set against that growth rate that I just talked about. And when it's set against that growth rate that I just talked about, you get this, this idea that it's probably actually more like a 30 or 35% cut in um, by that, by that period. And I want to, I want to kind of go into this Kyoto, uh, this Kyoto, you know, read into this Kyoto uh, protocol a little bit because a lot, there's not a lot of analysis, economic analysis that's conducted around the year 2000, around when we ratified and signed the Kyoto protocol to try to figure out what kind of policies would need to be put in place for us to actually reach this Kyoto, uh, this Kyoto target. And so I've got results from a, from a, from a few different models that were conducted. Some of these are global models that had Canada's specific region the models, others were Canadian specific models, and they were all trying to estimate what kind of stringency of market-based policy would be required to have us reach this, this kind of, uh, this, to turn our emissions around quite dramatically uh, starting in the year 2000. And they all suggested, uh, you know, carbon tax rates or permit trading prices in a, in a cap and trade system sitting around, say, $100 or $200 a ton uh, um, starting in 2000 and, and being, being carried through. To have this emissions really turn this dramatic corner of the Kyoto Protocol envisioned. Um, just to give you some, 
cents. Remember that uh, BC, uh, BC's carbon tax is now $15 a ton, so about maybe a tenth this level. Um, and that this would maybe represent, say, uh, say $100 uh, carbon tax would represent 50 cents a year increase in gasoline price. So pretty, pretty substantial prices. And, and way different than the prices that were envisioned in the plans that uh, Kathy mentioned earlier. The, the, the 2002 plan actually envisioned capping any potential price in a cap and trade system at $15. So maybe a tenth of the price that analysts thought would be necessary to put through. So I want to use that to kind of look at uh, where we are today. The, uh, the current uh, government plan, the current government target, is what, is what Kathy mentioned earlier, to cut emissions to 20% below 2005 levels by the year 2020. So this is kind of, uh, as Kathy mentioned, you know, a little bit less stringent than our Kyoto protocol target in terms of 1990 levels. But actually, if you look at kind of the, the, the gap that, that's, uh, that differentiates where we think our emissions will be without a policy from where we're promising to be, it actually looks pretty much exactly the same as that Kyoto Protocol target uh, 10 years ago. And, uh, and so we can, kind of, uh, we can kind of use some of that previous analysis and, and a lot of other analysis that's been generated since then to get a sense of what kind of policy we needed, you know, what kind of market-based policy we needed in, in order to get us to this, uh, this, this target that's been promised. And, and again, same similar sort of thing. There's lots of uncertainty in these models, but maybe a, maybe a, a carbon tax that's spread throughout the whole economy or a really wide uh, broad coverage cap and trade system with prices somewhere around $100 to $200 a ton carbon dioxide. So again, substantial prices. This represents something like 50 cents to a liter, uh, 50 cents to a dollar, sorry, uh, on the, the cost of a liter of gasoline. Uh, and, and again, in quite, uh, quite a bit of contrast to the most recent uh, plan that was issued by the, the Conservative government, which said we kind of envisioned capping uh, current prices in a cap and trade system at you know, $15 a ton initially maybe having them rise slowly up to $65 a ton by the year 2020. Um, and so really different to what analysts thought would actually be needed to actually reach this target. So it, it's suggesting that you know, the, the, the plan that the government had envisioned was really never compatible with this target. One last point before I finish. Um, I wanted to, to walk through some of the economic studies that have been uh, aimed at trying to estimate what the impact of, of say, $100 or $250 or $200 on the carbon tax or carbon trade system would be on the economy as a whole. This is one of the real sticking points uh, when we talk about implementing policies. And so this is kind of a complicated figure. It's got, uh, it's got uh, greenhouse gas reductions on this axis. Remember I said before we're talking about maybe 30 or 35% emissions reduction implied by either the Kyoto target or the, the current target. And this is uh, the carbon price. And like I said, the models that have been that have been run suggest a carbon price that would be required <coughs> anywhere between say 100 to 200 dollars a ton to reach those uh, to reach those targets. And if you follow that line up to the top figure, uh, you can see what what the models that have been put together suggest in terms of overall economic impact from that kind of, kind of policy. And they suggest say a uh, a GDP reduction from that kind of policy at somewhere in the neighborhood of one to three percent. And so this is the number that gets politicians really hung up. Uh, they, you know, there's no way that we can sacrifice economic growth of 1 to 3% uh, in order to meet some environmental goals or policy event that we can generations in other countries. And, and I think as analysts, we've done a, a fairly poor job of communicating that. This, this is a, a different way of communicating the same thing. Uh, uh, a 1 to 3% um, cut in economic growth by 2020 suggests something like a, a 0.1 or 0.2% change in the economic growth rate. Um, and so the top line is, a, this is a forecast of GDP. Um, the black line is historic GDP, and then anything off to the right of this gray line is, is forecast GDP. And so our forecast GDP is, is something of a kind of uncertainty, but something in the neighborhood of 2.6 or 2.7% a year. Uh, would be that top red line. And then these, the model suggests that you know, somewhere in between those two blue lines is where we expect to be uh, if we implemented a really, really stringent climate policy uh, over the next 10 years. And, and really not much to discern the three lines there. And, and this is, and I would say, this is the kind of message that 